having fun? Yes! The rare footage of Mark. <laughs>
My name is Chris Brunlett. I'm the marketing and communication manager with the Dutch Cycling Embassy based in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Fantastic. And how big of a crew do you have here at uh, Velo City Conference? Well, yeah, we are uh, a delegation of over 100 uh, Dutch cycling experts from 34 different public and private organizations. Uh, and yeah, we're bringing the best uh, best practices and, and experiences from the Netherlands uh, to this global conference and sharing what the, the Dutch have to offer. Well, we are riding through the streets of Leipzig uh, with probably two to 3,000 of our closest friends on the Mass Bike Parade, which is mm -hmm. the annual tradition every year when the host city accepts the Velo City Conference. They, uh, they plan out this bike route, not just for the conference attendees themselves, but anyone in the public that wants to join along. Mm -hmm. Closing the streets down to cars, opening them up to people on bikes, and uh, yeah, just enjoying the city for uh, an hour or two. Yeah. And what's really cool is I've seen a few families. You know, they've yeah, got their exactly. Bach feeds and... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's, you know, a really celebratory and stress-free way to get on your bicycle. There are not a lot of opportunities necessarily in cities to do so yeah um, so this is uh this is quite special despite the rain yeah yeah well it's not raining too hard but yeah it's a good point that you just made there especially for a city like leipzig that is making progress but they still have a long way to go so this does create a rather unique situation i mean you can see the the cycling infrastructure they have here they do have cycling infrastructure which is fantastic but it virtually it's about two feet wide and is designed for one person to ride in single file. And, yeah. uh, you know, the one thing that we always talk about in the Netherlands is how it's a social activity. It's done by groups of two, three, four people. Right. Uh, but unless you have that infrastructure that enables that type of social cycling, then it's not yeah. going to happen. Yeah. Chris, thank you so much. Thanks, John. Cheers. That's awesome. Okay, I'm Herbert Timmons uh, from the city of Utrecht. And what are we doing today? Uh, today it's the bike parade. And the bike parade is an essential uh, part of the Velo City Conference because you, then you meet the local people from the city where you're in. Now, you did something special this year, and I think you do it almost every year when you can. When I uh, can, I would do it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you rode your bike here. I rode my bike all the way yeah. from the Netherlands. Yeah. How far was that? That was 680 kilometers. And how long did that take uh, you? It took eight days. Eight days. Yes, and that was including one day uh, without uh, cycling. Well, of mm -hmm. course, we did a bit of cycling in the city of Kassel. Right. So we stayed uh, an extra night and we had talks with the university. Right. And uh, are you camping along the way? Yeah, we also camped. Okay. Yeah, so okay. we had our tent with us uh, on this bike uh, mm -hmm. and all the, the gear, all the cooking we also did ourselves. So we also uh, had to hunt for food, went to the supermarket. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm laughing because when you said hunt for food, I, I'm like, okay, I could just see her, but he's, he's out there looking for that bunny rabbit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we saw some deer and some, some animals passing by. But, uh, well, I had two vegetarians in the group. Too. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, more like hunting for carrots instead, yeah, yes. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, how many of these have you attended over the years? Uh, I think it's uh, 13 now. 13. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. And why is this particular conference so uh, essential and the reason why you keep coming back time after time? Uh, because it's like a family reunion mm -hmm. and then uh, you know in your family you have the black sheep, you have the, the rich uncle, you have the all, all the, the, the pretty girls and so on yeah and it's the same here yeah so that makes me really happy it gives me so much energy yeah because we are far away in Utrecht with uh, on the level of cycling right but on the other hand uh, to hear the the, the 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 stories of other people that makes me always so happy and it inspires me really yeah yeah, yeah. so which one are you are you the Sorry? rich uncle? I, I think I'm the rich uncle. <laughs> yeah, I share a lot of knowledge. A lot of knowledge because of that. Yeah. So one of the things that we've been talking about here at this conference is how do we accelerate this, you know, in a, in a time of uh, a sense of urgency. Uh, and, you know, because we kind of know what to do. It's yeah. just like getting it done. Any, it. any any quick hot takes that you of would course, like to do? Uh, if, um, you need po bold politicians mm -hmm. who really get the message, who understand how important cycling is. We 
understand what we know now. I'm also part of the Dutch Cycling Embassy. We know that a lot of planners, they have capabilities. They understand what to do, but they need polit bold politicians and also activists that go out in the street and then mm -hmm. ask for these changes. Yeah. Because change is possible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And Utrecht, as a city, is a good example of that. It of is. change is possible, yeah. Yeah, so we have to yeah. change our roads every 25 to 30 years. Yeah. Because uh, we are in a swamp area. Yeah. So that gives us a perfect opportunity to rethink yeah. what do we want with our roads. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the fact that, uh, you know, Utrecht, again, a good example of not afraid to correct a mistake. That's it. Yeah. So, um, that's also part of the Dutch culture mm -hmm. that we are learning by doing. Right. So it's not always, it's it's more like the, well, you might not like him, Elon Musk with the SpaceX. Yeah. It's the same attitude. You just start with uh, fiddling around and then you see if it works or it doesn't work. It's yeah. different than NASA. They are uh, the rocket science engineers. They are making all the details correct and then it takes uh, such a long time mm -hmm. so just start with something and ex dare to experiment make yeah. that part of your program yeah yeah and then you can make really quick progress yeah and one of the the, the biggest projects that i think uh, has made news in the last couple of years of course is the canal that's the canal yeah yes, in utrecht it still uh, attracts a lot of uh, media attention from yeah. all over the world yeah. yes and people also now want to copy it, even in the Netherlands. They yeah. say uh, in Amersfoort they want to have the water back mm -hmm. in the streets. But also uh, in other countries they are talking now, oh, we should copy the Utrecht example. Yeah. yeah. So just briefly, for those who may not be familiar with the story about the canal, uh, just give a 30-second overview of what we're talking about. Okay, well, it, it started in the 1950s when uh, they wanted to modernize the city of Utrecht and make more space for cars and they hired a uh, German engineer and he came up with a plan uh, to make a ring road surrounding uh, the old city uh, the old, and then uh, use the old moat and uh, put a lot of concrete in, in, the, in the canal and made a, made a road of that. Um, well, a, a part was finished but uh, also uh, the moat was uh, uh, made protected by mm -hmm. the cultural heritage uh, department and then uh, they said well the road isn't functional it doesn't need uh, to be that wide so let's take it out and make, let's make water again right because uh, the water is really uh, attractive and it's also functional yeah and so that, that took many years, correct? Yes, it took uh, 17 years yeah. from decision making till it, uh, the final opening. Yeah. I think that that's such a good example globally for people to understand that yes, even when something as big a, a, a decision is made, like building an expressway, yeah. that you know what, if it was a mistake, it was a mistake have the political will to change it and, and, yeah. and redo it. Yeah, we have done it in the past also with canals, that we have built canals and then closed it again because it didn't have any use. Right. And also with the railway lines, well, you have the same in America, railway yeah. lines were built, okay, we don't need it anymore, so let's abandon it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everett, thank you so much. You're welcome. Yes, yes. this is awesome. Okay, and you're the parade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the parade! <laughs> All right, well, Mark, you know, good to see you again. Good to see you, John. So, we, it seems like it was just yesterday you and I were riding with Jordan in, uh, in your hometown. Uh, yeah. So, we're here in Leipzig, Germany for yes, Velo are. City Conference. And we are very loud and proud. <laughs> we're very loud and proud. We're having fun. And we're yeah, having we fun. Are. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you've got your flag there yeah, and yeah, you're sporting yeah, the out, orange colors. Yeah. So, uh, you, you're really good at history. Let's, uh, let's do a little history lesson about orange. Why is orange, orange the, well, the color? Our king. His last name is of orange. Ah, so that is the reference. That's the yeah. reference. So, yeah. the Fantastic. House of orange reigns the Netherlands. The House of Orange yes. reigns the Netherlands. So that is, yeah. 
it's guys. fantastic. We love our king so much, but it is yeah, a yeah. nice color and it stands out. As yeah, you yeah. See in this crowd. Yeah. yeah, it's fantastic, and and a good friend of ours, uh, you know, you know, has done so well with his little YouTube channel that now the Orange Pill re Revolution and getting Jason, orange pilled. Jason. Yes, yes, Jason with Not Just Bikes, and uh, suddenly, you know, now I think you could probably, you know, Google Orange Pilled and you'd find out, oh, wow. But you've been doing this for a long time, much longer than Jason, and, you know, documenting and telling the stories and the history, and you and I have had that conversation before. But this is special to go onto foreign soil at a Velo City. And, and share this as a, as a huge delegation. You guys are yep. like over a hundred strong, I think, here. Over a hundred delegates. In yeah. The, in the, yeah, and you can tell they're all in orange. Yeah. Uh, well, not all, but all, most of them. Yeah. Yeah, there, it's a large delegation. Uh, we tr like to bring stuff to other people, but we are also listening. Yeah. And we're also listening to other people's problems and uh, hoping to help them with finding solutions. Yeah. So yeah, it's also nice for me to get inspiration. Oh, that's what they're busy with right. outside the Netherlands. Yeah. Or those questions arise, and I can maybe help there a little bit with making a video about such topics. That would be interesting. That's why I'm here mostly, and also to be proud. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Hey. hey. And that's another reason why we do this is is trying yeah. to engage to, with the the public. To be visible, yeah. yes. Cycling needs to be visible, and uh, it's very visible here now today. Yep. It's striking though; they have to close the streets for this. Yes. That didn't happen in the Netherlands, so yeah, that's yeah. the difference. <laughs> we just rode. You just kind of go. <laughs> and the police has to to stop all other traffic. Yeah. Oh, hey, look, hey, look at this! This is yeah. like we're watching the Tour de France, <laughs> yeah. splitting around the roundabout. So there's, uh, I, I predict that there's about three people who uh, don't know about your channel. So, uh, so what is your channel? What's My the channel name of it? Bicycle Dutch. Yeah. Dot NL or Bicycle Dutch on YouTube, um, and then you'll find me. There's only one. There's only one. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic, Mark. Thank you so much. It was, it was well, wonderful spending some time with you great here that again. You were here as yes. Well. It's good fun. I wouldn't miss it. <laughs> Excuse me, excuse me, let me through here. Oh Come on, God. excuse me, excuse me. Hey John, this is my friend Ben from Pittsburgh. He yeah. just lives in Leipzig. Ben from <laughs> Pittsburgh, how are you, sir? <laughs> so, so how do you enjoy uh, living here? Uh, it's good, it's really nice. Yeah? I wish there was better bike infrastructure. Yeah, it's yeah. Really nice. Yeah. yeah. Now, when you in, when you were in Pittsburgh, did you ride a lot? All the time. All the yeah. time. Yeah. That's how I tricked my wife into marrying. Ah, fantastic! This is a good story. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah. After she dumped yeah. Scott. I'm yeah. Just oh, wrong yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> take that off camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take that off camera. <laughs> and what organization were you a member of when you were in Pittsburgh? Oh, Pittsburgh. yeah. Oh, Bike yeah. Pittsburgh. Bike Pittsburgh. We know. We know all about that organization. Yeah. I'm gonna wear my bike Pittsburgh shirt today, but I've worn it so much that it is full of holes. Ah, uh, well loved. Hey, I, I think that was a hint. Get it, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a new one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Meredith. Oh gosh. Where are we today? We are in Leipzig. Leipzig, Germany. Germany. And we're here for the Velo oh. City Conference. Oh. And we're and we're slowing. We're slowing. We're, we're down. slowing. Um, so you presented today. I did. Yeah. Yes. Oh man, feels How was like that? ages ago. Yeah. It was great. I was yeah. excited to be on stage with some really great people and also have some really great questions from the audience, which mm -hmm. was packed. Yeah. I was actually kind of shocked because there was quite some competitive sessions at the same time. Yeah. Um, equally fascinating and important topics. So I was really happy to see that so many people came to learn about knowledge transfer and capacity building. Yeah, yeah. And that's a really important theme, I think, that you know has been talked about here at the conference a lot. Knowledge, you know, is not only facts and figures, which mm -hmm. would be the explicit knowledge category, but it's also um, uh, it's also about tacit knowledge, which right. is the 
intangible yeah. knowledge. Um, and in this context, you were studying a specific type of knowledge transfer yes. and looking yeah. at that. Yeah, and so with knowledge, you know, we want to um, think about how these two types of knowledge, mm -hmm. explicit and tacit, interact right. to then create what could be new knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually this is based on experiences. Right. And you know, what we're doing now is also a form of building knowledge, right? We are sharing this experience together as um, a, you know, bicycle community, um, but we are also, you know, riding a bicycle which which demands you know different cognitive functions physiological <laughs> functions um and so there's this you know combination of a lot of different things going on right right and in this case too this ride is actually open to the public open yes. to the yes. residents and yeah. so this may be the one and only time that they've had an opportunity to ride yeah. in a group of this size like this. and so yeah. there's there's an interesting sort of aha moment that could take place too there in terms of what streets are for what streets are for yeah, yeah. um there also could be perverse effects true true so, could be you know there could be people who look at this <laughs> event and say um you know what a what a waste of time yeah. or something yeah right? yeah Aww. or that little one up there or waving that little one. We you know more it's like the little ones yeah waving, yeah right yeah yeah and then capacity building yeah, when capacity in building. the context of what you were talking about today yeah. in that session uh, what are we talking about in terms of trying to move things along we know that there we need to have a bit of a sense of urgency to move things forward you know relatively quickly yeah. but what do we need to do from a capacity building perspective to to make change happen um well the framework that i proposed was looking at how we can see capacity building as uh, the interrelation between different types of resources. Mm -hmm. And that's usually what we talk about when we talk about capacity, right? right is right. The different types of resources that organizations or governments have. And uh, so one was knowledge resources, and this can be, you know, expertise, um, skills, competencies, but it can also be different types of uh, framings of the problem, how people understand what problems are in their organizational context. Uh, and then I talked about uh, relational resources. So how do uh, different domains within organizations or governments, how do they build um, uh, relationships, commitments, trust between, you know, different parties or stakeholders. And then there's the mobilization resources, which is all about how to develop new ways of working to activate um, hi Chris uh, how to activate um, you know implementation processes right um, and so this combination is really interesting when it comes to capacity building because how do we then scale up this right, right? how do right. we learn how do organizations learn to manage and anticipate these resources and what they need to uh, to move to move forward and moving forward can mean so many different things as well right, right? it's not just about building bike lanes it's, it's about developing a workforce right um, and it also depends on which industry we're talking about right right I mean, if we're talking about uh, urban planners or if we're talking about the bicycle industry or if we're talking about um, consultancies you know these are these are all different types of organizations that deal with bicycle planning design governance in very different ways and so we have to think about capacity building in all of these different ways right yeah. it's not just teaching engineers the width of the bike paths right it's right. so much more um, complex than that which also provides some freedom in right. thinking about what types of training programs uh, you know, organizations or companies or governments need. And it can be very diverse in that way, you know, and that's what's exciting to think about. But to scale up any type of capacity building efforts, you have to have a, a, a train the trainer approach. Right. Right? Because there's only so many organizations who deliver 
programs or right. training programs or you know workshops or knowledge so I mean luckily we have things like digital learning online learning that's great but only to a certain extent right right um, <laughs> but uh, there has to be you know there has to be this train the trainer approach that then can scale up these types of efforts yeah um, because one organization cannot train 10,000 people yeah. um, in a short amount of time. Yeah. Um, because you also have to think about the quality of such a training, right? How right. is that then? What is what is it? Is it? Yeah, I don't know. It's it's an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. Because every city is unique, and this is where we can learn from other disciplines that yes. are much more experienced in this. You know, human resources, public administration. These are areas, or or uh, uh, you know, domains that um, are very well versed in. Um, learning and development programs, right. yeah. instructional design. Yeah, um, I vividly remember my organizational behavior class in my yeah. MBA program yes. at Michigan. So yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hey, there he is. Okay. I'll come catch you. Yeah. Becca, you're on camera. I see. You see. I see yeah. myself, yeah. Yeah, I see what's out there. Yeah. Becca, where, where, where are we? What are we doing? We're in Leipzig. And we just stopped pedaling yeah. for some reason. Yeah, yeah. We need to start pedaling again. Yeah. This is unnatural for us to actually have a conversation and not be pedaling. Well, let's pedal. Let's, let's go. go. Yeah. That's not what we have planned for. That's right. That's better. That's more like it. All right, are we going to go? Yep. You know, fat. I was gonna say, if you want to keep going around and around, we could, but. <laughs> around and around we go. It's around and around we go. So, so we're in Leipzig, Germany. We are here for the Velo City Conference. Is this your first Velo City? No, it's not, but it's been a long time. So, okay. previous times for me were 2013 in Vienna and 2015 in yeah. uh, Nantes. Yeah. But after that, it's been eight years. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so Quite it's been a little while, yeah. yeah. And of course, we, we did have COVID in there uh, as yeah, well, we sort of disrupting things. Uh, so so you are from Olu, Finland. Correct. And uh, were you presenting today? No, uh, yesterday. Yesterday. Okay, fantastic. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, your presentation. What were you sharing with this global audience? So we were talking about campaigns. So, of course, uh, campaigns to like change perception, change people's mindsets, change politicians and de uh, decision makers' mindsets. We still do need those, but uh, especially if you amp uh, aim your campaigns to, so to say, ordinary people, you still need to have the product mm -hmm. that you are selling, otherwise it's false ad advertising. Right. So we need to have the good infrastructure, we need to have the good maintenance and so on, but we still do need those campaigns. Right. And. Uh, so it could be, for example, people who have just moved to Olu, they don't mm -hmm. even know that uh, winter, so cycling in winter could be so comfortable. They still think it's supposed to be miserable. Right, like that. right. And <laughs> we, we need to remind them and give them a chance to try it themselves. So they might have bad experiences from somewhere else or even in Olu. Yeah. But we also need to aim those campaigns at the decision makers. And uh, now having this international fame that all has regarding cycling in winter and cycling mm -hmm. in general in all seasons, that also helps a lot for the decision makers to understand that this is a big thing. Right. And over lunch, we were talking about the fact that you would love for us to get away from even saying winter cycling and just really focus on cycling all seasons, all, exactly, all year yeah. round. Yeah. yeah. Because nobody talks about winter walking, right. winter driving, or yeah. winter swimming is a thing, though. Right. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but yeah, getting it to the point of normalization where, oh yeah, of, of, course. of course. And and you and I had talked about this on our, our podcast episode, where if you get the maintenance right and create conditions that are truly all ages and abilities and very comfortable yep. and maintain them properly, then it makes it possible to ride all seasons. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it not only makes it possible, it makes it comfortable. Ah. See, I'm glad you made that point because too often it's like, oh, well, is it possible to do it? But is it truly welcoming and inviting? That's exactly. a different it needs level. To be yeah. Inviting. Exactly. Yeah. Especially because uh, there are always hardcore people who will cycle no matter what. Right. If there's seven meters of the snow and minus 100 and it's uh, raining frozen fogs and whatever, right. they will cycle. Yeah. But that's not <laughs> yeah. the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's my question for you. Hit me. Olu, Velo City Conference. Was my idea already like 15 years ago. Yeah. Tell that to the decision makers. Yeah. We yeah. really need to do that. I think it, it, there's, there's a good lesson, I think, that Olu could provide for many car-centric cities mm -hmm. that are built on a, a suburban sort of context because mm -hmm. in reality that's a big part of what your community is like. I mean exactly. obviously you do have a, a, a central core with some residents there but you also have a lot of neighborhoods that are what we would call suburban. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, to put it directly and honestly, we are a car-infested suburban uh, suburban hellhole, mm -hmm. hellscape. Right. So with decent bicycle conditions. Right. So it's possible to do that even in <laughs> on your mm -hmm. continent or some others and so on. It's definitely possible. It might take some time, but you have the space. You have so much space in your city. Yeah. And every city, every city you find in the world, there's always somebody saying that we don't have the space. Right. Like uh, 10 years ago, nine years ago, when it was still kind of okay yeah. to do, I was invited to go to Siberia, Novosibirsk, a city mm -hmm. of 1.5 million people over there. Oh, wow. And uh, I was watching the main street, Lenin Street, yeah, yeah. if you will. <laughs> <laughs> they had, I was counting how many lanes it had because we were sitting in a cafe somewhere up over there. Yeah. Next to the and uh, I counted 13 lanes yeah. on the yeah. street. Officially, I guess it's about 10. Yeah. But since the snow is covering everything, and even without the snow, there's probably nothing left of the markings that used to be there. Right, right. Still, the politicians are saying there's no space. There's no space. For yeah. Bicycle infrastructure. There's no space. They were correct. There was no space for bicycle infrastructure at the time, at least. Yes. I don't, at the I time. I doubt there still is. Yeah. Yeah. But we always have space. We just need to reimagine exactly. what the space we do have is exactly. used for. So, Pekka, thank you so much. It was wonderful to reconnect with you, have another chat with you, and more importantly, have another chat while we're riding. Exactly. Yeah, wonderful. Thank I you love so much, it. John. All right, all right, Meredith. I'm gonna squeeze in here, get up next to Scott. And... All right, Scott. It's your turn, man. Hi, TV land. I know, I know. It's just something else. Hey, so, so Scott, uh, is this your first Velocity? No, this is my third Velocity. I've okay. been to Seville and Nijmegen. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, have you had fun? So far? Yeah, yeah. 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 Leipzig is surprisingly beautiful. Look at this. I know. Well, look at that. Look yeah, at this. look at that. I point out the ugliest building. Yeah, there the you city. go. Look at <laughs> But look at these buildings. Yeah. Look at this Burger King. <laughs> it is it is an interesting you know uh, mix and and you've got your friend here who lives here uh -huh. he's also from Pittsburgh but yeah I mean you've got the that mixture of some of the communist influenced buildings and then some of the old historic buildings it's it's a really funky fun mix yeah for sure and I think it's still like fairly walkable it's it's no Berlin but like mm. it's walkable it's bikeable uh, you can see how much potential they have here yeah to change things, um, that they're starting to invest in cycling in a bigger way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. It actually seems a bit more reachable than, you know, for me, from being from Pittsburgh, you right. know, than going to like Amsterdam. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, well, spe we speaking of that, I mean, you know, Pittsburgh obviously has been working very, very hard. Uh, Pittsburgh had the opportunity to host a similar type of conference in 2014. Sure. 
And uh, any any key takeaways so far from this conference that you'll take home? Ah, I think focusing a bit more on on uh, accessibility and and making sure that we are just really listening to to people who who might have mobility um, disabilities and. Um, providing more opportunities for 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 more people to get involved in cycling and also mm -hmm. just to listen on how our work affects them mm -hmm. i think that that uh, will build a more inclusive community in pittsburgh uh, and people who have their voices heard and are more civically engaged yeah uh, so that was a really good session i went to this afternoon and it just got me thinking about uh, what more we can do in pittsburgh yeah. to, to build a, a a broader, more inclusive community, not just around cycling, but around safe streets. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that I really, every time I visit uh, the Netherlands, one of the things that I really come away with is just how empowering that all ages and abilities network is for people with with mobility issues and disabilities. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it does. It definitely makes the streets safer. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's the narrative that needs to shift a bit too and like the actual the amount of of purposeful outreach needs to shift but yeah the the results certainly result in the results show that you know streets get a lot safer with more and more investment in biking and walking infrastructure um but yeah it's it's really about building like the the broader community that feels like a part of those decisions being made i think yeah is uh is something that is a takeaway i, I think we've been trying to do it at, at bike pittsburgh and in pittsburgh in general but we can be um we can we can invest even more time and energy into it and i think it's a worthwhile investment yeah if, you know, uh, Chris and Melissa's uh, book, uh, Curbing Traffic, they, they had a chapter talking about accessibility. And really, I think having some champions from the disability uh, movement themselves, the advocacy efforts that, you know, can help tell the story. That way it's not us able-bodied people telling oh, yeah. the story. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, you know, we're getting some narratives and some champions from an inclusivity yes, perspective saying, oh, no, this is good for us, and, and helping to allay some of the fears uh, that, that maybe some have in terms of right. misperceptions. Right. But you and I can't necessarily do that. You know, right. it, it's, it really kind of needs to come from them, which is something we've also learned from you know, other areas when we think of uh, yeah. you know, being more equitable and, exactly. you know. No, that's super, that's, that's a good point. Um, and I think it can even be brought into uh, to people living in poverty and like really oh, yeah. how how safe street mobility infrastructure, cycling infrastructure, more ubiquitous bike share, more affordable bike share uh, can help really lift people out of poverty or right. at least address some of those cost of living concerns, health concerns. Uh, I think that those are those are all people that you know we we as like the cycling movement or biking and walking movement need to be centering in our work. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Scott, thank you so much. Yeah, I always love little impromptu conversations. <laughs> okay. Good stuff. Nice
strange combination. Yeah. This is a this is if very I very. Uh, uh, excuse me, excuse me, Leonard. I don't think that this is what they meant by bike train integration. I'm, uh, I'm innovating right here, right now. Ah, innovations. Hey, that's what Velo City is all about. Innovations. Guided bicycle system. I love it. I love it. Guided bicycle system. I love it. <laughs> All right, that's all she wrote for the Velo City Bike Parade. That was a blast. So this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.